Hi, everyone, and welcome to another uh, episode of Astronomy at Home with Bill Bernia. Uh, my name hey, is Chris, Chris Miller. <laughs> Hi, Bill. My name is Chris Miller, and I'm a librarian at Coquitlam Public Library. We've had the pleasure of interviewing Bill over the past few weeks. Uh, we'll have another one next week as well. Uh, for today, we're going to be talking about planets. So I've got some questions about planets for Bill, uh, which he's going to answer in a minute. But going back quickly to last week's episode, Bill mentioned uh, a tool uh, which you can actually make yourself, um, and it's called a planisphere, and it's something that you can use to kind of uh, map out or, or orient yourself uh, for the night sky. And so it's got kind of a, a round bit that you can kind of rotate uh, so that it fits the, uh, the view of the sky above you. And uh, I found, I poked around a little bit and found a planisphere uh, kit. So something that would allow people to make a planisphere from home. So I'm going to, uh, first of all, bring up one of the pages. And let's see here. Gonna go and do a share screen. So I'm gonna see if I've got that one ready to, to share right off the bat. Let's see, not quite. Oh yeah. So um, first, I'm gonna go. And I apologize for the slight delay. I'm still, I am still at the point of trying to uh, trying to master the controls for this thing. Uh, for there we go. So I'm going to do that and do a share. So this is a site uh, called inthesky.org, as you can see up in the corner of the screen. Um, and there is a link here to making your own cardboard planisphere. And you can see what it looks like. Um, credit to the creator of this, his name is Dominic Ford. And what you can do is if you go to this page, you can actually uh, click on a complete kit with instructions. If you happen to live in the Lower Mainland, which I'm guessing for most of the people who are watching this video, uh, it's already perfectly situated for a current latitude at 50 degrees north. And I'm gonna show you a little bit what the kit looks like because I thought it looked pretty cool. So I'm gonna stop sharing this page and I'm gonna bring up the other page that actually shows what the kit looks like. So I'm gonna do a new share screen and there we go. And So this is just describing what you need, and, and it's very, very simple. You just need basic supplies at home, a couple of sheets of printer paper, or if you wanted something a little bit more durable, uh, sort of like a thin cardboard, uh, you need scissors and a little bit of glue and uh, what they call a split pin fastener, which I think is just one of those uh, things that you can stick through something and then sort of separate the tongues of it so to kind of hold something in place. And then there's the assembly instructions and pieces, which you can see right there showing uh, showing uh, constellations, which we had talked about uh, last week. So there's a central star wheel there, they call it. And there's the, uh, the planisphere base and all the bits. So um, anyway, this is, uh, this is something again, in the sky.org with in the sky uh, separated by uh, hyphens. You can bring that up. Uh, thanks again to Dominic Ford for creating this wonderful thing. And look it up yourself if you would like to create your own planisphere to kind of uh, map or orient yourself uh, based on the night sky. And I apologize for the diversion because now we need to get into some questions. That's the reason why Bill is here. Um, and I'm going to just quickly rewind back here. We're talking about planets today. And uh, I was going to start with a very basic question. Um, Bill, what differences do you notice when you're focusing on a planet in the night sky as, as opposed to a star? Are there any visual discrepancies or clues that would show that this is a planet, not a star? Well, <clears throat> Chris, if you have a, a telescope, um, it's, there's a big difference because <clears throat> the stars don't look bigger in a telescope. They look quite small, like a point. And uh, there's no way of making them larger or blowing them up. To, uh, to, to show a big view of them because they're just so far away that they don't, um, they, they don't get magnified. However, the planets, <clears throat> because they're relatively nearby, um, can show disks. So some of the planets are, are easier to see than others, but Jupiter and Saturn show significant disks. You can see features on their surface and the ring around Saturn is visible uh, in a small telescope, such as the one I've got right behind me. Um, this one will will pick off the ring of Saturn, and as you can see, it's not a, a large uh, 
um, astronomical instrument small and uh, it, it comes on a tripod. I can pick it up and often do and I take it out the front door and put it up on the lawn and there you go. So the planets show disks because they're relatively nearby. Venus as well. Uh, Mercury has a smaller disk and Mars is smaller too. Um, now there are other planets like Uranus and Neptune but they're really not that visible. They're not visible to the unaided eye and they require a little bit of expertise to find them. So really, from the point of view of the backyard astronomer, the solar system has, um, has only a few objects in it, Mercury and Venus, the interior planets, and Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the three external planets. So the five of them are the ones that um, are useful for uh, observing in telescopes. Not to forget the moon, of course, we we never want to forget the moon, but the planets, this is the case. So far away, Neptune just looks like a dot unless you have a very large and expensive uh, uh, gear to uh, observe it with. Which planets of all of them appear largest or clearest to us in the night sky? Well, it's going to be Jupiter. Now, Jupiter isn't the nearest planet, but it is, the, um, it is quite large. It's a very large planet, and so you, it always has a big, nice, pleasing disk to it when it's observed even with a small telescope. Occasionally, Venus gets as big or even bigger, but um, for Jupiter is the old reliable because it's always um, showing itself uh, to us uh, fairly significantly, and wh whereas Venus, of course, is always covered in clouds. So Jupiter's going to be the winner as far as this goes. Also, is four major moons are visible, even in small telescopes and uh, larger binoculars. So you can see Jupiter with um, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, the four moons. And I have a picture um, of what Jupiter looks like in a telescope. Now, this is not a highly magnified um, drawing or, or, or photograph, but it shows what it looks like um, in a conventional telescope. So now, of course, it's not in color. These are black and white. But I think you can see that it's sort of vague and indistinct in, in some places. That's because the object is far away and you're looking at it through a sea of air in the Earth's atmosphere. So this, if you imagine it colored yellow, would be pretty representative of what Jupiter looks like in a small telescope. <clears throat> if you had just a pair of binoculars in the backyard, uh, but with decent magnification, uh, what sorts of features could you pick up? Will you pick up sort of a, a clear coloration then if you're staring uh, through a, a good pair of binoculars or will it appear large enough that you could you think you could make out any features on it? Well, it won't uh, be uh, large enough in binoculars to see uh, what I just showed you. Uh, what I just showed is the telescope view, right? So that's what you'd see with this. But in binoculars, they only magnify seven, eight or ten times at most. So uh, really, Jupiter just looks like a yellowish dot, and but around it, you can sometimes see moons. So the further away moons, like Europa, Ganymede, uh, sometimes Callisto, show up as little dots right beside Jupiter. So you look at Jupiter and focus carefully, and then look to see if there's little dots beside it, little kind of uh, companions to it, right? And uh, these companions are its moons, and they shuttle around and go here and there, um, so over a few nights, if you look, you'll see a different orientation, a different configuration of the moon. So they can be picked off as well in binoculars. But to see details of the surface, um, then, then really you're, you're in the territory of telescopes. You need a telescope. How do the moons actually appear? Do the, do the moons have their own coloration as well, or are they, are they barely distinct? Well, they're, they're mildly yellowish uh, in the binoculars or, or sometimes colorless. Most of the objects in the solar system, um, including so-called red Mars, which is not all that red, but most of the objects in the solar system are uh, colored a variation of yellow. And that's because the, they reflect the light of the sun. So the sun is strongly yellow in the way we perceive it when its light bounces off something. So the, the planets are variations on yellow. Ju Saturn is strawish. Jupiter is kind of uh, yellowish, strong yellow. Mars is kind of yellowish golden. And Venus, because it's so uh, bright, uh, fools the eye and the white overwhelms the yellow. So it appears kind of whitish. But as a general rule, um, it, is, uh, it is yellow that predominates in the solar system because they're getting all their light from the moon or from the sun. <laughs> and of course the moon, if you look at it, it appears yellowish as well uh, for the same reason. 
Now, you mentioned a planet before uh, that isn't visible to the naked eye and that you need a strong telescope to be able to focus in on, and that, that would be Neptune, uh, right. the most distant planet in our solar system. Um, I've seen pictures of Neptune that make it look very, very blue, um, right. but if you have a telescope, is that, is that the same color that you would pick up in the telescope as well, or would you men uh, as you mentioned, would there be a yellowish tinge related to the, to the sun's light for, uh, for Neptune as well? Well, Neptune appears bluish in photographs and is slightly bluish um, in, a, in a powerful telescope. Uh, the reason for that is that the light comes from the sun and uh, goes through uh, the, the Neptune atmosphere. But when it's reflected, the, um, most of the wavelengths are absorbed. So the blue color is related to the reason the sky is blue on the Earth. That is, uh, the other colors are scattered. Right, so we see the blue, and it's the same with Neptune. The methane um, is a big absorber of light in the red uh, part of the spectrum. So therefore, Neptune looks uh, bluish uh, because uh, the other colors don't uh, transmit very well. Okay. So, but if we took away the atmosphere and somehow we could see the inner part of it as a solid surface, it would probably appear much like the moon. <clears throat> Is, is Neptune, um, how many of the planets actually have sort of a discernible atmosphere? I mean, I know that there's gas giants, but it sounds like, like Neptune, it's, it's got a, it has a sort of a solid surface, is that right? Um, well, Neptune, Neptune has an atmosphere around it, but if you went inside, you'd find a slushy ice ball in the middle, right, surrounded by a dense atmosphere. So that's the case with Neptune and Uranus. So they're, they're both ice giants. And then Jupiter and Saturn are different a little bit. They are uh, regular gas giant planets and uh, are surrounded by huge mantles of gas. The only planet that we can really see um, which has a solid surface that uh, in, the, in the sense that we uh, common sense reveals as being uh, uh, a surface you could walk around on would be the planet Mars. So if you look at Mars, you can sometimes see uh, features and th those features are uh, on the surface of Mars and if you could stand on Mars you could look up and you would see stars and things like that and it's a solid rocky and barren place. So that's the only planet that we can actually see a solid uh, common sense surface to it that we can walk around on although you need a spacesuit because there's barely any atmosphere there. <clears throat> Uh, I, I was curious, just on, on the topic of, of gas giants, to move away from uh, planets with, with solid surfaces. Um, with Jupiter being a gas giant, uh, what sorts of elements is it mostly made up of? Like, what is what what constitutes Jupiter? Well, it is mainly made out of hydrogen and helium. So, Jupiter has the same composition as the Sun or stars. So, when the um, uh, when the objects were made, when Jupiter and the planets and the, all the stars were made, they were made out of a huge ball of gas and uh, uh, mainly hydrogen gas. So they're highly, uh, uh, their composition is highly influenced by that. So Jupiter is like a star, but it wasn't big enough to be a star, so it became a planet. If the object isn't big enough, then it will become a planet, um, like Jupiter, Saturn, or even a much smaller one, the Earth being one example. So these objects are uh, hydrogen and helium. Um, the, the rocky planets, like the Earth and Mars, are, though, are made out of different things. They're made out of more rare elements, such as, uh, uh, such as aluminum and iron and titanium and cobalt and things like that. So the Earth and, and Mars and Venus have a different composition of ho hotter, uh, the hotter mix put together uh, denser elements, so that we have iron and nickel in it, whereas that's not that common in other places. I, I was curious uh, of the other the other big uh, gas giant that we sometimes associate with Jupiter. You had mentioned Saturn before mm -hmm. with its rings. Um, just a couple of, a couple of funny things that were going through my head. One was uh, when we're when we're viewing Saturn what tilt of the rings do we actually see? And does that ever change in relation to us? Is there any sort of um, wobble to the axis of its orbit or do we wobble enough that we'll sometimes notice that we're getting catching a slightly different angle or, or a slightly different view of Saturn? 
Well, indeed we do. The uh, rings um, make a, they take a sort of a schedule about 17 years long. And that in that 17 period, the rings go, go slightly up, tilting up and then down. And in the middle, and I think the next time this happens is five or six years from now, the uh, rings actually are straight on to us and then they appear to disappear entirely for a couple of days because they're extremely thin. So when, they're, when we're looking at them edge on, there's nothing to see because um, their thickness is less than the, the thickness. Well, if you, took the, uh, um, if you took the footprint of the Coquitlam Library, right, and how, how that's like half a block or so, that would be about how thick the rings are. They're very, very skinny. Whereas their distance across from one side to the other is more than 160,000 kilometers. All right, so they're one of the thinnest things in nature known, comparing their width to their thickness. Interesting. Okay. Um, I was you meant you had mentioned sort of the visibility of the the rings of Saturn. Uh, what what color would they appear to be if you if you brought them into view in a strong enough telescope to actually discern color? Well, they're usually the same color. They're kind of yellowish. However, there is a black line on the ring that goes all the way around. That's called the Cassini Division. The Cassini Division is a place where the rocks avoid because of gravitational pulling and pulling and pushing. And so there's a sort of a gap there, and that gap is where there's just no material. So it can be seen in a, in a good quality telescope. As it looks like a black hair that's been laid on the ring all the way around it. And so if the rock is in that black area, it will fall into the center and, and leave it, or it will leave by the outside, but it won't hang around. What, uh, uh, what sorts of objects then congregate in the inside part of the ring and then uh, on the outside in the, in the, the, outer, the outer length? Are there, are there different types or is it just, just kind of by chance what, what ends up where? Well, the, um, uh, there are rocks of different sizes, uh, very small, like, like um, the size of grapes or apples or things like that. And that and pieces of dust constitute the rings. That's what makes the ring up. So um, slightly larger objects can exist in the ring as well. And they uh, may help to keep the material there. Otherwise, it would be dispersed. The ring is not a, a permanent object. It's, uh, it comes and goes. Some, it gets material from some of the outer moons of, uh, of the Saturn system, like Enceladus or, or uh, Tethys. These objects throw out uh, dust, and the dust falls into the ring to replenish the ring, and then other particles from the ring leave. So it's more like a river where material is always coming in and going past. So the rings are permanent in what we see, but any individual particle is short-lived. Uh, so it, as I said, it's more like a, it's not like a, um, a mountain, it's more like a river. So, so some of the objects that you mentioned, even if they're relatively small, they may end up getting sort of tossed off by the ring and floating in some direction. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's right. One of the other planets, Uranus, has a ring system too, and it has little shepherding moons. So these are tiny moons that are on the inside and the outside of rings. And if a ring particle wants to leave, the shepherding moon comes and pushes them back. Um, so they maintain there. There's, that's why they're called shepherding, like shepherd dogs, right? Keep making sure the sheep don't, uh, don't run everywhere. They maintain the uh, flock. So these little rocks, as big as, say, houses or a few kilometers across, they're micro moons. And these micro moons push and shove the other littler rocks to make sure the ring is, is stable over time. I was uh, curious about one thing, well, two things actually. The first thing I'm going to mention, I'm going to ask is um, for people who are interested in focusing on Jupiter and Saturn in the night sky, what part of the sky uh, should they orient themselves towards to, to focus in on those objects? Well, Chris, if, if they have a planisphere, they're, they're uh, miles ahead. Because right now, Jupiter and Saturn are both found in Sagittarius Capricorn part of the sky. So that's low in the southern part of the sky. Um, so you go outside, find a southern horizon where you can see all the way to the ground and uh, where it's flat, and you're looking for the southern stars in those two uh, zodiac signs. So um, 
Now they rise quite late right now. You'd have to be up by one or two o'clock in the morning. But as the summer wears on, they rise earlier and earlier. And Jupiter and Saturn are now quite close together. So it's possible to see them at the same time in the same uh, wide field binoculars. Um, if you can, your binoculars can see about seven degrees or so, then you might be able to pick them off both at the same time. Jupiter, however, is much, much brighter. Whereas Saturn is a bit fainter, but still relatively bright compared to the stars around it. So it makes it easy to find. At the end of the year, Jupiter will go past Saturn. It will catch up to it around Christmas time and then go on the other side and pass it. But in the summertime, we'll see them uh, quite close together. And as they move, their relative motions, you, you can see uh, week after week. So it's a good time to get used to the fact that the planets are in motion around the sky, whereas the stars stay fixed in their places. So Jupiter will be moving forward to catch up to Saturn, but every once in a while they go backwards, having retrograde motion. And you can follow this in the sky uh, with a pair of binoculars. And if you take the trouble to get a clipboard and a piece of paper, just make a drawing of the stars with Jupiter and Saturn. And then over a month's time, if you look uh, continually, you'll see the stars are in the same locations. But Jupiter and Saturn have moved a little bit to the right or to the left, depending on where they are in their, in their orbit. And indeed, they, they make trips around the sky, large trips. Um, Saturn taking nearly 30 years to go all the way around the sky and come back to the starting gate. And um, Jupiter taking around 11 and a half years to make the same trip. For, for people who, who live in homes, of course, they're often surrounded by trees or other things that might block their view of the low part of the, of the horizon. Mm -hmm. Uh, would it be a good idea for people uh, who are trying to view Jupiter and Saturn to try to find high ground somewhere, like a little bare hummock or hill or something like that, or even to go to the upper story of a house where they're kind of above the above the tree line and the building lines around them? It's a good. That's a good point. It's a good idea to try to find a place where you can see all the way to the south. So. Um, yeah, someplace uh, like a park or something like that, or perhaps a um, uh, just a flat area where there's uh, no lights, things like that. Um, somewhere in, in your neighborhood, there must be some, some such place. So find that place and uh, look, towards, uh, uh, look towards the southern part um, uh, of the landscape, towards in the direction of the river, and then you'll see uh, all the sky that you need to see. But if there, you're right, if there are buildings directly to the south of you, you won't see anything because all this takes place low to the ground. Uh, we had talked about uh, constellations in a prior episode. And one of the things that, that interested me, and it could be that there's a simple explanation for it, but I was curious about the fact that there were so many constellations um, that had Greek names or seemed to be inspired by Greek myths. Mm -hmm. And we live in a solar system in which many of the objects are named not specifically for Greek things, but for Roman things instead. Uh, so Roman gods, Jupiter as opposed right. to Zeus, yeah. um, and, and so on. And I, I wonder why there's that sort of disconnect, or, or maybe it's an apparent disconnect. Maybe, I, I, I don't even know. Uh, maybe maybe there is, it, it's, uh, it's a more obvious uh, answer that, I'm, uh, that I could see. Uh, but I was curious about why sort of Greek with constellations more common, uh, Roman with planets more common. Well, um, I think it, it really this is a nomenclature uh, matter. And uh, uh, so in other words, why do we name things the way we, we do? So uh, Mars is Mars, but um, it, that would have been called Aries by the, uh, by the early Greeks. Um, I think the reason, part of the reason is just that these objects weren't that well known to the Greeks. And as uh, mathematical astronomy developed, um, it began to be clear where these things were and um, uh, what, uh, what the role was in the solar system. And so the Roman names seem more appropriate be just because we're moving on in time. Yeah. Now, having had our chance to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of planets in particular, I'm gonna see if I can just sort of share a couple of, uh, a couple of images. We've got maybe, maybe a few minutes left in the broadcast, but I, I made the effort to find some, okay. some, some things here. So I'm gonna do some shares and I'm just gonna make sure that, that we can see those things. So hang on with me for a second and I'm gonna do 
Let's see. Let's see. Oop, that didn't come up right, did it? Hold on. I'm going to try that again because it didn't seem to work the first time through. Let's see if I can do that. There we go. It's up now and I will do a little, little share for that. So, okay. Um, okay, here we are. Yeah. So we see, we see an image of Saturn uh, coming mm -hmm. through, uh, looking very, very gray, sort of a pale colored shot of Saturn. Uh, you can see, um, the, the Cassini division. The Cassini divider. It's it's very well illustrated there. That's I noticed right, also yeah. there's there's an interesting looking pattern, and it's almost like hexagonal in shape or something. That's up on looks like up at the very polar part of Saturn with sort of mm -hmm. a like a bump or a blip in the top. Do you, do you know what that yeah. might be? That um, there, there's um, um, because of our orientation to um uh to saturn it's often been noticed that the very top of it there's kind of a box like structure right this box like structure is uh is we see because of our our view um across the top of it so this has been commented on a lot but the uh uh by observers but it uh, if you could look up above it and look down on it then you would see that it is um, in, in fact kind of roundish like everything else but yes the box like effect is a kind of a funny feature so sometimes there's um, uh, storms on Saturn, and uh, I think there was a, there was a picture showing a storm going across its disk on one of the other uh, pictures. Um, from time to time, there are storms appear on Saturn and they move around. And one of them was discovered in 1933 by the then famous actor uh, Will Hay. Now Will Hay was a comedian and he made uh, comedy movies in the 1930s and 40s, but he was also a backyard astronomer. So in 1933, he found a uh, uh, sort of a, a storm on Saturn, reported it to the astronomical uh, people. Yeah, there we are. So this is, this is what he was looking at. Uh, not this one, of course, but in 1933, there was a, another one <clears throat> quite similar to this. So um, it's his uh, main, uh, uh, claim to fame is as a, an actor, a television actor, right? So, uh, well, not television, but I mean, a movie actor, right? So he was a movie actor. And if you look him up on Wik Wikipedia, Will Hay, you'll find uh, thumbnails of some of the uh, com uh, comedy movies he was in in the 30s and 40s. So he was a backyard astronomer too, with a little telescope, but he kept a, uh, an eye on Saturn and was the first person to see such a feature on, uh, on that planet in the early uh, 1930s. So movie stars are involved too. <laughs> it, it, it's an amazing image here. These are more NASA images that I've been sharing. Yeah. And that one, it almost, I mean, it, it comes, comes through as so distinct. Uh, and obviously they, they may have had to sort of manipulate the photograph to sort of uh, regularize the colors or whatever they do with it. But it almost looks like a, uh, like a drip of, of oil paint or something like that that's going yeah, across the surface there in a big yeah. streak. Yeah. Um, Anyway, one of the one of the amazing amazing things yes. that uh, you can you can see even just inside our own solar s system. So I'm gonna stop the share for that. Um, I'm going to see. I feel I feel bad. I feel like uh, like Jupiter's a little left out. So I'm going to see if I can find um, one thing to connect with for for Jupiter. Just get a nice picture of it up, and I'll share that. And I think we may only have a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to, uh, to bring up that shot. So there's another one there. Okay, there we are. Well, that's a great picture. Um, this shows the red spot on Jupiter. Now, the red spot is a storm, but it's not as well known that this storm is not unique because if you look at the picture, you'll see a roundish. Um, uh, whitish uh, objects, those are storms as well. So in other words, the, um, the white spots are just littler uh, versions of the great red spot. And right? so the red spot is just the biggest one of these, uh, uh, these stormy entities and, and was the only one visible before there were larger telescopes. It, it almost, yeah. as I'm sure many others have observed, it almost looks like a big, a big marble with 
with all the sort of the streaks and details you'd see, except more so. Uh, yeah. Looking into a into a glass marble, uh, but it's a fantastic shot. And I guess what it means is that when you when you look at Jupiter, um, you're likely to see change from one one time that you look at it to the next. Things will have moved about or possibly reproportioned themselves. Uh, some of the streaks and things that look like contours, if they just reflect winds and things blowing gas, they might be a slightly different shape than when you than when you last looked at it. I'm guessing. That's that's right. It's um. Um, I guess the easiest to see thing on Jupiter is the two bands that make it up, the two dark bands. Um, and also, you can see shadow transits as well. A shadow transit is a black dot that appears on Jupiter and then wanders across. The black dot is a shadow cast by the moons. So these dots appear as little, perfectly round little dots. And you look at them, and you can see them in the telescope. Sometimes two of them are visible at once, and 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 occasionally three. So the shadow transits um, migrate across as the moons move around Jupiter, a uh, great bulk. So if you were um, somehow situated on one of these uh, dark uh, spots, then from your point of view, the moon of Jupiter would be over top of the sun, and you'd be seeing an eclipse of the sun. Of course, no one's ever seen that, but that's what it would be like. Yeah. I'm going to stop that's a sharing. Picture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, credit for that one to NASA and uh, uh, I think a, a citizen astronomer or scientist named Kevin M. Gill uh, for that lovely picture. Okay. Um, and we're, I th we're getting close to the end of our time right now, and I don't want to be cut off, um, but um, we're, we're hoping to talk about. Uh, space exploration and technology, I think, is a topic for next week, right. including some of the things Very that we might be out in the sky. Uh, but yeah. but other things we'll maybe talk about on just sort of like a like a, a little bit more of a theoretical level, maybe. Um, and I, I think I've got a couple of questions that I that I'd like to ask you that might even harken back to the moon, Bill, because uh, when we talked about it before, I never had a chance to ask you uh, what part of the moon. Uh, the astronauts in 1969 actually touched down on and whether you can actually spy that part of the moon and focus in on it using your, your binoculars and telescopes. I'm sure you probably can. We'll maybe get to that next week is one of the, one of the questions I could ask. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and we'll talk about the International Space Station and various mm -hmm. other things um, come, come next week. But I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning into the episode uh, uh, today of Astronomy at Home uh, with Bill Burnett, and we look forward to uh, seeing you again next week. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Uh, please uh, visit us again. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chris.